This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or The Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. Chapter 2 of Scott McCloud's influential book, Understanding Comics, is called The Vocabulary of Comics. If you haven't read Understanding Comics, let me paint you a quick, audio-only picture. Scott's is a comic book about comic books. An illustrated version of the author himself guides you through the elements and capabilities of comic books and the stories they can and do tell. He starts by discussing what things we might consider part of the comic book medium. He talks about how their visual characteristics, art style, layout, panels, gutters, the whole nine yards, allow comics to function the way they do, and that this makes the medium a unique and important one. If you're interested in visual storytelling, not just comic books, but telling basically any story with pictures of any kind, I and comics nerds everywhere can't recommend Scott's book highly enough. Which might, at this point, lead you to wonder, uh, isn't this a podcast about sound? And good point, yes. Yes, it is. Which brings us back to chapter two of Understanding Comics, The Vocabulary of Comics. So on the first page of it, Scott's comic avatar, bespeckled with a mop of black hair and wearing this crisscrossed blazer over his iconic lightning bolt t-shirt, he's standing next to Rene Magritte's painting, the Treachery of Images, which is comprised of two elements. There's a wonderfully semi-cartoonish rendering of a tobacco pipe, and underneath it, in thin script, the sentence, Ce ci n'est pas une pipe, which in English translates to, This is not a pipe. I know, we're still not at sound, but we're getting there, I promise. So McLeod, via word bubbles, explains, Indeed, this is not a pipe. This is a painting of a pipe. And on the next page, comprised of six panels, two columns of three, all showing Scott standing next to Magritte's painting, he starts, well, actually, that's wrong. This is not a painting of a pipe. This is a drawing of a painting of a pipe. N'est-ce pas? Panel two. Nope, wrong again. It's a printed copy of a drawing of a painting of a pipe. Panel three. Ten copies, actually. Six if you folded the pages back. Panel four. Silence. Scott is just looking at the reader out from the page. Panel five. Do you hear what I'm saying? Panel six. If you do, have your ears checked because no one has said a word. Of course, the translation of this idea from the visual tactile medium of comics to the audio-only medium of podcast, audio-only, that is, unless you're following along at reasonably SND on Instagram, it ruins the trick a little bit. I hope, regardless, you can see, or, I guess, hear, what's happening here. As in, the location. Well, not location, like the imaginary spot in which... Okay, this is getting complicated rather quickly. So, uh, anyways, standing next to one of many printed copies of an illustration of Magritte's painting talking about the representational aspects of visual reproduction, MacLeod, in addition to asking if indeed n'est pas un pipe, isn't it a pipe, has also half-asked of his own dialogue, n'est pas un son, isn't it a sound? <laughs> 
A fundamental feature of writing is that it has the ability to implant experiences in your brain, to give you things to think about and with and to reach beyond the mainly visual sense required to experience the writing itself. Unless, of course, you're reading Braille. But either way, this is what writing does. It relies on one sense, maybe two, but can activate others. It can conjure scenes and characters, sounds and settings. If it's really good, tastes and smells, maybe even physical sensations. It's representative. The arrangement of little shapes on the page represent other things. From buildings and people to emotions and abstract theoretical concepts out there in the world. Sometimes the little shapes represent sounds. Now, before we get into greater and greater thicks of it, let's make one important distinction. This distinction is between hearing words written on the page as though they are being spoken, and hearing sounds described by the words written on the page. The former is what my first grade teacher called a head voice, my own voice inside my own head saying the words on the page to me as I read them. It's distinct from the purely mental experience of sound phenomena. When you read descriptions of sound experience, it is as though they are or could be occurring to your own ears. One is a practical experience, and for some, though not all people, a necessary part of reading. The other is an aesthetic experience, brought upon when an author successfully translates their observations of the world into text. It's this experience, the aesthetic one, that we're going to talk about first, and mostly. Powerful linguistic representation of sonic experience ain't easy, owing, as we've talked about before, to the exceptionally ephemeral nature of sound. To do it well is to possess some great literary skill. Take Marcel Proust's one-sentence description of the near-silent evening as the narrator of Swan's Way listens out their bedroom window. Exposed upon this surface of silence, which absorbed nothing from them, the most distant sounds, those which must have come from gardens at the far end of town, could be distinguished with such exact finish that the impression they gave of coming from a distance seemed due only to their pianissimo execution, like those movements on muted strings so well performed by the orchestra of the Conservatoire that, although one does not lose a single note, one thinks all the same that they are being played somewhere outside, a long way from the concert hall, so that all the old subscribers, and my grandmother's sisters too, when Swan had given them his seats, used to strain their ears as if they had caught the distant approach of an army on the march, which had not yet rounded the corner of the Rue de Trevis. This is just beautiful. Though it communicates a highly subjective experience, it still feels accurate. I might not have known how to describe this quality of crisp distance possessed by sounds on a quiet evening, but as soon as I read this, a little light bulb goes off, and suddenly I can hear from my own back window as a kid growing up in the suburbs of Boston this distant but distinct sound of, yeah, lawn parties, or my next-door neighbor working on his car, and everything else going on in the neighborhood. It's the reflexive remembrance of things past brought about by a passage of Proust. Who would have thought? But man, that's just, I mean, that's a very difficult thing to do. It's like sitting down at the piano and writing the Trois Gymnopédies or walking up to a canvas and just painting the treachery of images. It's not a thing one just does. Furthermore, it's not an instantaneous experience on the part of the audience. It's intellectual. It unfolds and progresses as the work does. Luckily, there's a much faster and more instantly effective approach to the reproduction of sound in writing. Pow! Biff! Whack! The onomatopoeia is the textual rendering of sonic experience in a single expression. Oink! Honk! Zing! A word which stands for a sound that sounds like the word. Vroom! Clang! Burr. 
The onomatopoeia is employed far and wide, but I feel pretty confident in proclaiming that it has no more famous a use than in the context of comic books. And here, we've finally worked our way back to Scott, and the question I have so graciously put in his mouth. N'est-ce pas un son? Is it a sound? A question which I'd like to admit at this point we're not going to get or even attempt an answer for. In the words of Steve Goodman from his introduction to his book Sonic Warfare, which we're going to be talking about in a later episode, actually, quote, It's always more useful to ask what something can do its potential, rather than what it is, its essence. If we were to ask whether the onomatopoeia employed in comics are sound, or if the reading of them constitutes hearing, we'd more than likely end up at the very unsatisfying answer of sorta. If that sorta is more than only sorta unsatisfying, we could dig a little deeper and work our way towards the slightly more encouraging yes, if, or maybe to my personal favorite, the enigmatic no, but. However we slice it, though, in the same way Magritte's pipe is only sorta or varyingly un pipe real, the snicked, for instance, produced by Wolverine's claws every time he extends them, is only sorta, or varyingly, an actual sound, un son réel. So instead, we're going to follow Steve's advice and ask about the potential of snicked as an actual sound. What it and other onomatopoeia can do if we think of them that way. The onomatopoeia is definitely more overtly sound-like than Proust's passage describing the hushed coherence of his narrator's neighborhood at night. The onomatopoeia is more directly sonic than literary, though to be fair, their use is not always not literary. This is, I'm sure, why it came to be used in comics in the first place. It's a short walk from onomatopoeia to physical-ish experience. According to Tim DeForest in his book Storytelling in the Pulps, Comics, and Radio, comic book artist Roy Crane pioneered the use of onomatopoeic sound effects in comics. Roy Crane was a famous cartoonist whose career spanned most of the 20th century and who was responsible for the comic strips Buzz Sawyer, Captain Easy, and Wash Tubs, all three of them popular adventure strips. DeForest writes that Crane had fun adding onomatopoeia to his work, stating, Words, as well as images, became vehicles for carrying along his increasingly fast-paced storylines. So, here we have it. The onomatopoeia contributing to the speed of a story. Sound words traveling, so to speak, at the speed of sound. McLeod talks about this in Understanding Comics, too. Sound effects, as well as word balloons, he says, quote, add to the duration of a panel, partially through the nature of sound itself, and by introducing issues of action and reaction. He explains that a panel showing just an illustration, in his case, a single still image from a basketball game, is an instant frozen in time. But as soon as the creator adds any indication that sound is being made, it's like they've hit the play button. Though the image remains still, we imagine it to be taking place in time. It's no longer a frozen instant, but rather one of many possible instants transpiring while something audible plays out. When we consider onomatopoeia as sound, or the experience of them as hearing, it places us in time. This is distinct from what we'll call literary time which is the amount of time it takes one to read and internalize words on a page. For some people, literary time moves very slowly. For other people, literary time moves very quickly. Sonic time has an understood length. We know Wolverine's snicked to take but an instant. Same with a pow or a zap. And in certain other situations, usually admittedly having nothing to do with onomatopoeia, we might know exactly how long an illustrated sound takes. 
For instance, we know that the scene in issue three of the comic book Sex Criminals by Matt Fraction and Chip Zdarsky, where Susie sings along to fat-bottomed girls by Queen at the billiard bar, we know that takes four minutes and 17 seconds. Because that's how long fat-bottomed girls is. Unless it's the version from the Greatest Hits record where they fade out on the coda while Brian May continues to play guitar. But complaining about the injustices perpetrated on re-releases and Greatest Hits records is another episode for another day. The point being that audible sound cannot exist in instants. It must exist in collections of them. Preferably sequential collections. Oh, you fat bottom in world girl, gonna go let it all to make hang out the rock round. Which is to say, assuming we all agree on what counts as a beginning and an end, a sound is a finite thing. Most sounds, nearly every sound, is in time such that it has a length. It starts, it goes for a bit, and then it stops. A sound takes a specific and coherent amount of time to occur. However, if that sound of a specific and coherent length of time is included in a comic book somehow, that doesn't mean that each of us will take that same specific and coherent length of time to read it. Rather, we know, sometimes roughly, sometimes exactly, how long in the world of the comic that sound has taken. In our world, time will continue to move the way it always moves for each of us. In a flat circle. Of course, even if we are both listening to the same recording of Fat Bottomed Girls for the same amount of time, we may not hear the same things. I might focus on Freddie Mercury's voice, you on Brian May's guitar, our friend on the last part of the second Saga Trade paperback she's trying to read while we so inconsiderately blast music. To consider onomatopoeia as sound, we've also got to account for the subjective nature of their experience. Though we might be looking at literally exactly the same beautifully rendered sound letters, it doesn't mean mentally we're hearing the same thing. Maybe when you read POW, you mentally hear a POW sound effect, but it's probably not the same as my POW sound effect, which, for the record, sounds like this. Maybe you don't even hear a POW sound effect. Maybe you just hear your head voice saying loudly, POW, or maybe you hear nothing. There's lots a comic book artist can do to close the gap between intention and reader experience. Comic onomatopoeia are usually big and colorful, they're hard to ignore, and in doing so, running the risk of interpreting the panel as silent. Zaps and onomatopoeia with all kinds of K's and Z's drawn in blue with vibrating pointy edges let readers know that they're hearing the arcing sound of electricity. Shings drawn with metal sheen let the reader know that they're hearing that stereotypical overly Hollywood sword drawing sound. Brian Fairbanks on Tumblr linked me to a post by David Brothers on fourthletter.com talking about comic artist Jason Stokoe's illustration for the sound Godzilla makes, which, in case you've forgotten, is this. In the post, Brothers quotes Stokoe, who says, I got completely stumped trying to figure out what the sound effect for Godzilla's trademark roar would be. So I looked up what it looked like run through an oscilloscope and just traced over that with some vague lettering. And the effects are, I mean, I find them really convincing. The lettering is aggressive and menacing with this shape communicating very clearly the morphology of the sound itself, how it progresses over time as Godzilla is vocalizing. For me, here, the gap between intended sound and reader experience feels very, very small. And finally, recently I was reading the Deadpool Dead Presidents trade paperback, and there's this point where Deadpool, who is a mercenary 
He's mauled by an elephant tusk while trying to kill zombie Teddy Roosevelt. Because, you know, this is just the kind of thing that happens in Deadpool comics. Anyways, in this panel, there's drawn this big red bubbly splorp. S-P-L-O-O-R-P. Splorp. The edges are rounded and liquidy. The lettering is misaligned along the center with the first of the two O's much larger than the second, maybe suggesting, like Godzilla's roar, how this sound is to progress over time. The first O is in some way sonically bigger than the second. So all this design, though, soft or jagged edges, color and letter or word shapes, can only do so much to inspire in readers the sound imagined by the creators. Really, Deadpool is the only person perfectly capable of closing the gap between illustrated sound and sonic experience itself. Because as his torso is skewered by the elephant tusk, splorping and everything else, he says, gross, my body's never gone to splorp before. The joke here is that Deadpool, who has an incredible healing factor and is essentially incapable of dying no matter how terrible his injuries, has come so close to death so many times that he's suffered considerable brain damage. The main effect of this brain damage is that Deadpool believes, or knows, I guess, depending upon how you look at it, that he and the rest of his colleagues are actually comic book characters. And so, as Deadpool's body splorps, he sees said splorp and is able to reconcile completely the rift between textual splorp and sonic splorp. And unless the writers and artists working on Deadpool have written and drawn splorp from their direct personal experience of an actual splorp in the real world we could argue very convincingly that even they don't really know what their own splorp sounds like. Only Deadpool does. Which makes a little more sense than it should, because, I mean, we can't even agree as an international community on what dogs sound like when they bark. And that's a thing lots of us hear, all the time, every day. Dogs making sound in English go bark and woof and bow wow. In Japanese, they go wan, and in Spanish, guau. Amongst the many, many things that contribute to how we hear the world, the language we speak appears to be one of them. When we hear a sound in the world, to write it down is to rely on the sounds we think of language as being capable and appropriate for making. Those things are very different for different languages. I wonder if it happens the other way, too, which is to say... My Wolverine snicked and your Wolverine snicked might be very similar, especially if we both speak English, but they might also be totally different. What you hear in your head when you read S-N-I-K-T exclamation might be complete nonsense to me, especially if you're from Denmark or Egypt or Argentina. I'll post a couple comic panels featuring illustrations of Wolverine's snicked on the Reasonably Sound Instagram so you can see how it's drawn if you haven't ever. And if you go check it out, while you're there on Instagram, if you're of the mind, record an Instagram video of yourself imitating that snicked however you imagine it. However you see fit, with your voice, some kitchen utensils, with your own Weapon X installed adamantium coated claws if you have them. Do it however you want, however best approximates what you think of snicked as sounding like. Post it to Instagram and hashtag it mysnicked, hashtag M-Y-S-N-I-K-T. I'll do the same. Maybe ours will match. Maybe not. Either way, they'll at least be sound words traveling at the speed of sound. My name is Mike Rignetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find supporting visual material for each episode and other fun stuff at Reasonably Sound's Instagram account, Reasonably SND. You can find weird opinions and terrible jokes at my Twitter account, which is Mike Rugnetta. No spaces, no underscores, no dashes. <laughs> <laughs>